Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I'm Terry Winograd. Um, quick announcement. Next week, we're going to have Mike Cohen and Mariam Kambar Garrett from Google. They're both in the research lab working on speech, and the title will be Speech versus Text. So you probably are familiar with a lot of the things Google is doing in that area with cell phone search and stuff like that. So it uh, should be a great talk. This week, we have Adrian Fried, who's from Synmat. I've learned it's pronounced at Berkeley, uh, which is a computer music group that's actually been around for quite a while, for about 20 years, uh, very similar to Karma, the group that John Chowning here started at Stanford many years ago, uh, and uh, one of the top places in the world for really interdisciplinary look at music, technology, computing, uh, and how those all come together. Uh, Adrian's special interest is actually dealing with instruments and what you do with them when you perform. So his talk is on the anti-ergonomy, I don't even talk, I title it, the anti-ergonomy of musical instruments. And I'll let him explain what that means. Yes, the motivation for this, the two themes I've chosen today, um, well, the first one is noticing uh, a resurgence of interest in multi-touch. Um, <coughs> musicians have been doing multi-touch for thousands of years, um, an electronic multi-touch at least since the 20s, and you'll see I've got some slides suggesting in the late 1800s there were some uh, research on electronic multi-touch. And so one of the things I noticed, and Bill Buxton's also noticed, is that uh, there's a lot of reinvention of the wheel going on. So we gave a talk last year uh, kind of working backwards from current multi-touch, um, and I took us back to the early 1900s. So I'm going to take a couple of points out of that and um, try and suggest that the performing arts in general and music in particular is a good, good vehicle for studying um, extremes of performance. And uh, uh, the way I like to think of it, in, and one of the challenges you all face building uh, systems and <coughs> experiments to test them, is that often what you're trying to do is minimize friction in the interaction to improve the productivity but you, at the same time, have this confounded variable, which is the inertia that people have to learning new things. And the nice thing about working with uh, musicians is that, uh, certainly the musicians we uh, collaborate often with in our center, is they are uh, enthusiastic and paid to overcome inertia and very skilled at it. So you can give them a new interface, a new idea, and be sure that they will put the time in and the energy to overcome the inertias and, and give you interesting um, results in terms of performance. Um, so let me give you an example of that. Yes. This is my friend Subhashish Bhattacharya yes. teaching my daughter okay. the key gesture to play the tabla. Now, interestingly, yes. there really are only two gestures. Uh, the tap and the slide on the top and a very a relatively simple instrument but <laughs> notice where his gaze is So, uh, in my field, there's a, a conference been around for five years now, a New Instruments of Musical Expression, it's a Neem conference, and there's probably a couple of hundred new instruments created for that, not all of them are shown each year, there's, that means there's probably thousands of new instruments being experimented with around the world. And yet, by my count, the whole of the last century, there are only really four or five new instruments in use. So, if you're a musical instrument designer, it's the, the chances of you building an instrument, the odds seem to be against you building an instrument uh, that will have a significant cultural um, influence. So, 
uh, I've been trying to understand, one of my motivations, trying to understand what it is about uh, those instruments um, that succeeded. And uh, one of the rather confusing things, which is the second part of my uh, theme, is that uh, a lot of the musical instruments we revere are actually not ergonomic. The, they're often health, they're often specialty <coughs> doctors and health problems associated with them. And um, they can be extremely hard, uh, they have lots of elements that make them extremely hard to play. So we have to get a handle on this, if we're, um, this anti-ergonomy and its importance. Uh, let me just go back quickly uh, and talk about why you might uh, want to work with musicians and musical data when building a multi-touch. Well, musicians somehow manage to beat some amazing constraints they're under, because if you look at reaction times, uh, for vision, 180, 155 for touch, and audition for 140. So one thing that's interesting is that sound gives you a slight edge, and that's uh, one explanation, perhaps, as to why Subashish wasn't even looking at his drum, because he already knew what was going on there uh, many milliseconds earlier. And interestingly, for people who think that haptic feedback is important, it's been extremely hard, and there's some experts at Stanford's, it's been extremely hard to come up with an experiment that strongly shows how valuable haptic feedback might be to a musician. And one thought about that is maybe it, it comes too late. Um, the other thing that's amazing about hearing is that we, um, we can set up experiments where people can tell the difference between extremely small processes. Certainly, uh, 500 <coughs> nanoseconds of jitter in a, a digital audio stream uh, are detectable by people. Um, we routinely, as hand drummers, control sub-millisecond processes. So, um, just as a reference point, most of the multi-touch, the touch pads, the mice, the USB controllers that you're used to using sample at somewhere in the 30 to 60, if you're lucky, the 100 hertz range. Which means if you take something like a Wacom tablet and a pen and you attach the pen to a drumstick and, and hit the surface with the drum, the tablet doesn't even pick the data uh, up because the, the stick has bounced in and out before it's even been scanned. So one of the things we know about uh, musical performance is that um, it's much better than the performance that we're giving people. So that means we don't really know as a culture um, how we could use that performance that musicians are able to acquire. We, we're not building interfaces, we're not building hardware, so we don't know what we're missing. The other interesting thing about sound uh, is that it's really the first uh, virtual space. You see, I don't really occupy the sound space. Um, uh, I occupy physical space. You can't occupy the same space as me, but you can occupy the same sound space. We can all project, sing together, talk together, play. So it, as a medium, it's a very special one. Um, and that suggests that it, Iba, and it has very special uh, importance in terms of cultural binding. So that suggests that earbuds, portable music players, and cell phones uh, are actually asocial media devices. They actually interfere with the potential of the uh, sound space um, for us to communicate. And the other thing musicians can do um, routinely, which we defeat in our design of computer-based music uh, 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 interactions, is multiple independent streams of activity, not just corded gesture sequences. Now, let's, let, me, let me explain that in a way that uh, I think it will be a little more compelling, but I need your assistance. So I've learned when talking about gestures that there are enormous differences between people of the understanding of what a gesture is. I recently worked with a, a, a French colleague and we were translating uh, a big uh, taxonomy we'd built of um, gestures, musical gestures. And uh, I know a musician that's very good with the flick gesture, so we put that in and he couldn't find a translation to French for flick. And it wasn't because the word wasn't there, it's because it's not a gesture that's very important. <laughs> So what I want you all to do is to flip out the little thing that you can put your laptop on and put your two hands over that surface and you're going to learn a sequence of four gestures uh, that will allow me to make a number of points through the rest of my talk. And 
There's a little mantra which is go park the car. On the word go, we're going to put both hands down. On the word park, we're going to pick our dominant hand, in my case my right hand, and put that down. Um, then we're going to alternate the, on the other hand, back to the dominant hand on the car. And we're going to do that, I'll start slowly, go park the car, go park the car. Now watch what I'm doing and try and follow the exact timing without the words. And I'm going to slowly speed it up. Now what I want you to do is look at your dominant hand and count the number of times. Sorry, I can't talk and do this at the same time. Uh, we'll go back to it. I want you to count how many times your dominant hand strikes um, in one cycle and then uh, count the non-dominant hand. So here we go again. Go park the car. So I have two on my non-dominant hand, which I've exaggerated with my ring finger, and I have three on the dominant hand. So I've taught, as far as I can tell, all of you to do the three against two polymeter, which in traditional music instruction is considered a difficult uh, task and is often delayed. In fact, I can find you websites of teachers who have won prizes for traditional music teaching uh, with pages and pages about how difficult this is and what, the, what you have to look out for. And I'd actually suggest that there already there's an anti-ergonomy issue going on here because you see a music teacher may have a financial interest in slowing you down and putting you into a traditional <laughs> method-based system. But um, and just quickly, uh, some of the engineers here will say, well, that's not really parallel behavior. We don't have two independent parallel streams because the lowest common multiple of two and three is six. So we should probably generate a little internal clock of six beats and then we just pick which ones to go on. So these are really entrained gestures. But uh, I, would I can suggest a couple of reasons why that uh, might not be the case. And in fact, it's an important and unknown problem in rhythm right now. We don't really know how we manage to do these multiple streams. Here's a quick example. I was bragging to a guitarist, the guitar teacher, ha that I could do this two against three on my guitar. And he said, oh, yeah, well, uh, when I was in Greece, I was playing with a percussionist there, and we were doing this piece ten against three. So, so I said, ten against three? Well, the lowest common multiple, that's 30. You can't possibly do that at the tempo you're doing it by subdividing. The, um, so I'll just give you a quick example of that. Uh, it goes something like this. Uh, so I need to generate a reliable 10 set of beats and there's a trick called the ax ax uh, and it goes like this takata tikka tikka toka the takata tikka tikka toka so that's 10 because they're grouped 3 2 2 and 3 takata tikka tikka toka the takata tikka tikka toka so that's 2 against 10 10 not too hard but here's 3 takata tikka tikka toka the takata tikka tikka toka the takata tikka tikka toka and um, it's not actually that hard although music teachers will tell you it's hard So concurrency, in the iPad, if you look at the APIs, we have a model and a training as engineers to break all these tasks down into sequential tasks. We're throwing away a key ability you all have. Um, so let's talk about multi-touch. Um, multi-touch, as I said, <laughs> it's not just Apple that does multi-touch. Uh, this left two-thirds of the screen um, are things I've built or been somewhat involved with here or there. Uh, um, well, there was a giant pointing stick here last week, but I'll point this way. Um, where to start? That's a very easy to make two-point touch tablet at the top. You can turn any resistive touch screen into a two-point tablet. Um, this one is, my boss plays this one, he won a prize last year with it. It's a whole array of XYZ pads, it's called the slabs. Uh, this one I'm going to hand around for you to look at. Someone wouldn't mind rushing this. Hey Ed, <laughs> volunteered you. Could you run that up and down? Uh, my daughter sewed this and um, it's a multi-touch, it's a six by six one and 
It was to point out that anyone can do multi-touch if they have a, the right thread and a $120 sewing machine. Um, this one, actually, I'm cheating. This is a, a, a tilt sensor done out of fabric, just to point out that you can take these materials and do something else. Uh, the round one called the Tableau is a circular multi-touch. Again, using the fact that fabric is very um, malleable and flexible and we can make shapes other than the conventional rectangles. And the music industry has been doing multi-touch for a while. That's a Korg product and a, a Yamaha product called the um, Tenorion. In fact, that's a girl, all girl group called the Tenorions that only play that instrument. So, so I'm going to work backwards in time. These are some fairly recent ones. Tactex in 2001, at our suggestion, built a multi-touch into a guitar top plate. And uh, let's see that what one of my um, Diane Douglas the two did. Two duplicate images are always exactly pi radians apart from each other, and that makes them look like a reflection and creates more symmetry. And lastly, the uh, the x-axis on the right hand, controlling the uh, pitch of the overtone, um, also determines the number of reiterations. Two the pads like this, but the fundamental larger. The pitch and the overtone pitch uh, creates a zoom factor. And uh, the farther apart they are, the more reiterations we see. And uh, so that's it. I wrote a piece with this for a guitar and piano and drums and sound painter, and it's called Time Lapse. Thank you. Can we go back to the video. So she made those pads herself with my instructions. Actually, you can figure it out just by looking at this. It takes about 10 minutes to make one of these. And this is my preference currently, rather than build instruments for people, a way to do participatory design is to show them uh, how to make the instruments and give them the tools and they can make them the size they want. And she built the physical controller and the software and it allowed her to tackle a problem that she'd been thinking about for a long time, which was, can I play imagery and sound at the same time? So both those processes she was controlling were being controlled concurrently. And uh, let's look at another example where we combine multi-touch. This is from 2001. This is uh, Arm Lee, Matt Wright, and the performer here, um, John Schott. To set this up, he's going to do an accompaniment to a silent movie. He's loading some sound into some buffers using foot pedals, and he's going to use the multi-touch to control the way those sounds are used later after he cues the movie, which he's about to do. This is the nerd's view of what's going on. The audience sees the movie on the bottom left. Um, we, we quickly got tired of the pinch gesture and I discovered that the triangle, uh, since our surface, touch surface detects pressure as well, was a more useful uh, starting point for concurrent gestures. And John learned to create triangles of various shapes and sizes, literally, and remember them literally in minutes. What's interesting about triangles and touch? Well, if you're performing in the dark and you, uh, you're moving your instrument up in this direction, it's nice to have a gesture that's um, invariant on rotations. Uh, and you can just plonk it down anywhere on the surface and it registers itself if you like. And what we do is we compute a whole series of 
uh, measurements from that triangle. Um, we look at its in-circle, its area, uh, the base to height ratio. There's dozens of them, in fact. Uh, I think they have a list of, of some of them there. Uh, you'll notice um, they're encoded in open sound control. That's a protocol uh, uh, Matt Wright and myself developed some time ago. Its significance these days, probably to your work, is that it's all the multi-touch um, research is built on top of um, the TUI standard, which is built on top of open sound control. This is a standard way of naming parameters that gets rid of um, my least favorite thing about using technology, which is manuals. Uh, basically, all the messages are self-describing um, uh, using uh, words that uh, people choose, uh, not random numbers that uh, standards committees choose. Uh, so those triangle information was encoded this way, and it makes it easy to build applications. Uh, there's kind of an inherent lie when I'm up here talking about my work, because almost everything I do is collaborative, and I just wanted to, uh, if you f find anything interesting uh, as I go here, please look at Senmat's website and, and read the papers from my collaborators. Here's an example. This is the Cordophone Innovation Group. We built that uh, cello and its associated software over a three-week period uh, last year. So this is a somewhat typical configuration for our collaboration. Francis Marie Wheatie is a world-famous cellist, famous for playing with two bows and being very adventurous in many ways. But um, she managed to like the idea of replacing the, st that I suggested, of replacing the strings all together with rods. So that instrument has rods that get bowed. And um, uh, it's myself, of course. I, was, I did the Luthery, uh, the physical <coughs> and sensor design and construction. Um, uh, that's Andy Schmieder, who is a mathematician, but did the firmware design and developed a thing called MicroOSC, which is a very productive environment for developing uh, the sensor flow. And um, that's John McCallum on the far right, who's a PhD student just finishing his degree in composition. And one of the things you'll notice about the configuration is that none of us are doing the thing that we're known to be best at. And my, it's another example of anti-ergonomy. My experience, it's much more productive if we're mentoring each other with a new skill. And that's, that's one of my uh, tricks to get a lot of work um, in a short time, which uh, Francis Marie's schedule imposed on us. And you can find out more about that instrument on the site. And, um, but let's go back in time a little bit. 1985, uh, that's Bill Buxton's capacitive multi-touch. Uh, before that, um, we have a synth music synthesizer with a touch screen LED for drawing waveforms and so on. And the bottom right is Bob Bowie's uh, um, probably the first true reasonable resolution multi-touch screen with, with pressure. And uh, it's a bit hard to see in this picture. Yeah, in fact, it's impossible in this picture. Um, the size of the crosses that are being drawn under the fingers is proportional to pressure. It's from 1983. Um, I built my first multi-touch, uh, which I don't have a picture of because I was a kid and just doing it for fun, um, around the same era Don Buchler was. I was inspired by the Stylophone, which is a tablet-based musical instrument from the 70s. Um, and I decided I wanted a polyphonic one, so I built a, a keyboard much like this one that Don Buchler built um, and combined organ, that combined uh, tones in an organ kind of configuration. And this is a really important instrument um, it's from Salvatore Martorano called the Salmar Construction. It's very large, very large number of multi-touch points. And for me, what makes it really, imp w with uh, lights underneath them, what makes this really important to me is that the, it was inherently parallel. Those, there was no funneling of the touch into some central sequential program. The hands were directly controlling large amounts of uh, digital and analog hardware running in parallel. Um, Let's go back even further, and I'm actually skipping uh, a really productive period in the late 40s and 50s. And let's go back here. Um, this is the instrument on the left, top left is the gnome, 
which has all kinds of unusual things, uh, somewhat shocking things about it. We'll talk a bit more about that later. But let, uh, let's look at this. In 1930, uh, Laertes published a textbook on electronic music that actually you could use quite reasonably today. Um, it covers most of the issues, including user interfaces, timbre. Um, um, but all they had though then were tubes. In fact, not even the rich range of tubes we have now. Uh, but they were already thinking about this linear touch instrument on the left. And this is the Halertion. And uh, you can see the four bands running across. It is a, it's definitely a parallel multi-touch. Uh, I've looked at the schematic carefully and read more in the textbook. And, and uh, there it is as a console device. So as you can see, multi-touch is quite old. Uh, you can go back even further to electromagnetic. This is actually a a touch-controlled uh, writing device. And here's a mechanical system from uh, the main wood in 1897 that used electromagnetics, pneumatics, and mechanics. Um, he's actually blowing on a tube that, that uh, spins a wheel that causes mandolin-like vibrato on some of the strings. There are strings running through the neck, under the neck, uh, over the neck. Um, and amazingly, this instrument still exists. Someone found it and is trying to restore it, I believe. And of course, we can go back even further and look at uh, polyphonic touch. But let me go back for a minute to the, uh, <laughs> the gnome instrument. Um, uh, she's sitting on a metal top bench, and that's a key feature of this instrument. So. Because uh, the metal top bench is connected to the amplifier and amplifying the signals that are mixed through her body from the key she's touching. Um, her feet are controlling some signals from the amplifier, between the amplifier and the loudspeaker that control volume and the timbre sound quality. And, um, uh, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm fairly sure, I don't know that this instrument uh, still, still exists, but um, I've, I've seen lots of evidence that it, it was really built. This wasn't, um, in fact, I think this is from an advertisement for it. So there are quite a few not very ergonomic things in that. So let, let's move on to the, the ergonomics issues I'd like to raise. So um, this is a standard grabbed off Wikipedia kind of definition. Um, they're quoting the International Ergonomics Association. So the key things that we're looking for si building systems which optimize well-being and system performance. Let's look at those high heels for a moment. On the left is the list of problems, and on the right, the benefits. Um, most of the benefits you'll see have to do with the appearance. Now, um, the point I want to make here is that the value, and therefore the system efficiency, is not really an inherent property of the system, but it has a lot to do with the constructed interpretation of the people using it. Because if someone finds the partner of their, their life partner of their dreams by wearing the high heels, they're going to say the cost was worth it. This list of wonderful things that can happen to you, what do you think results in all these things? Acne, high blood pressure, heart disease, shrinking of the breasts, shrinking of lots of things. Yes, yeah, steroids. This is the Balco drug thing, and there are a couple of people who are involved in that. Well, of course, though, those are obviously bad things, so they were banned, right? Well, actually, they weren't banned uh, in uh, baseball. They have a three strikes, you're out rule. They send an interesting message to people who might be inspired to play sports that uh, don't get caught is really the message. Um, uh, other, that's not true of all the sports, but um, th there's no outright um, zero tolerance ban in the sports. But, and this is my way of evoking a well-known thing in ergonomics called the safety paradox, that uh, going to the trouble of setting things up to be safe often lowers efficiency of the system. You often can't seem to get both safety and efficiency. Here's another example. So the only thing you control when you drive a car is the distance between 
your car and the vehicle in front. And it's interesting, but people feel safer driving a car uh, than being in a plane because they're in control. But the problem is that, from, at least in my experience, 95% of you are driving behind me, too close to me, and I can't really control that, which means I'm probably not any safer because I'm in control. <coughs> and most of you have taken a California driver's test where you're actually tested on this question of how far away you should be from things in front of you. Um, and yet, so we have to answer the question, why do people, uh, and it varies a lot from one culture to the other, why are people driving way closer than, than these uh, these distances. Um, I'll suggest a couple. Uh, most of you have not experienced the consequences uh, when things go wrong, so you don't have a good estimate of what the risk is you're taking. Um, also, in the absence of a good estimate and the, a and the absence of taking very seriously your driver's test, uh, you tend to do uh, what's called flocking behavior in animals. You tend to look around and look at all the other distances which is why it becomes a cultural thing. So in Paris or Rome, you might be this far at all times from your car in front, um, whereas here you might be a, a car, a two or three car lengths. And this problem has a name, and I was actually amazed. Um, it's called epistemic uncertainty. Uh, I was actually amazed because um, of how recently the papers are from people whose job it is to look at safety, to actually look at this question of uh, how people are interpreting s safety and estimating risk. <coughs> and because uh, it's had a name, uh, it's been in the blues songs, uh, cocaine's for horses and it's not for men. Doctor says it'll kill you, but he won't say when. Um, and so I refer you, I'm not going to go into great details, but it's, it's comforting to know that people are actually thinking about this. Um, let's look at uh, another ergonomic question, hand washing rates in public restrooms. Uh, now I can actually more or less get, uh, you can find results all over the map in this particular area. There are just dozens of studies. You can have males washing more or less. You can have uh, the number of people being a factor. Greek sorority, where they wear, a, someone's in the room wearing the shirt, influences things. Actually, I, I'm not going to I'm not very interested in that. What I'm interested in, the fact, is we're not getting anywhere near 100%. And so you can put signs up, you can do all kinds of things, looking at the ergonomy of this restroom and trying to keep people's hands clean and not spread and not have diseases being spread. But the scale of the analysis we do in ergonomy is often wrong because the place, there's a weak link in the chain here, which is the door handle. Because those 5, 10, 20, 30 percent of people who aren't washing their hands are opening the door on the way out. And those of you who wash your hands are also opening the door on the way out. So what that means is an ergonomic public restroom has no door, which is some interesting challenges. Uh, there are such things at San Francisco Airport, for example. Um, so the point I want to make here is that ergonomy and the efficiency of a system depends on the scale of analysis, not just the scale of um, space, but also on the scale of time. So toilet training has got worse. Uh, 1980, 26 months uh, was the average. 2003, it went up to 36.8 months. Why? Why is it, why are people um, getting out of diapers uh, so much later? Well, because of disposable diapers. And this is a little odd because um, Anyone who's worked with cloth diapers, various strategies, no diapers, cloth diapers, disposable diapers, and believe me, I've done many, many thousands of them, um, knows that there's a real benefit for the person changing the diaper to have um, a disposable diaper. The kids are more comfortable in them. In fact, they wick away the moisture so fast, um, there's no discomfort at all. In fact, they, they expand in a kind of comforting way, I imagine, and they get warm. So now the problem is, um, there are several problems here, but one of them is you can't really fault a company which chooses a name like Pampers for pampering your children. That's something we're supposed to do, right? Um, 
uh, and on the limited time scale of changing that diaper, you're definitely optimizing a situation. But in the long term, and this is a feature of a lot of things I call training wheels, um, you're actually slowing down the learning. And I'm not making this up. There's a study, many studies on it. Um, uh, here's another one, a very recent study you may have heard relating to how many hours a day you watch television. Um, and actually, the, the key thing is it's not really about watching television. It's about sitting down without getting up and moving around. And this was done in Australia, and they kind of drew the line at four hours of uh, um, uh, TV watching per night. It turns out the average in the US, which is staggering to me, is five hours. And it used to be said that cell phones and iPods and iPhones and the internet, that would lower TV usage. But what happened is people started using the recorders so they could watch TV whenever they wanted. And so actually, uh, it's gone up slightly in the last few years. And um, so that makes it chairs very interesting objects because there's endless literature and design literature on the ergonomy of chairs. But for me, an ergonomic chair is one that pushes you out off the chair every 30 minutes. And if you build one, let me know. Um, maybe just an alarm is good enough. Um, here's a subtle one. Um, we all know about this, how the supermarket inconveniences you by scattering the things you need around to maximize your path length through the store. That's a well-known um, uh, anti-ergonomy. Uh, and, and there there's a kind of conflict of interest that, that, uh, and a power struggle that works its way out. But there are more subtle ones. So a pricing consultant will tell a menu designer that what you want to do uh, with the menu items is center them because then people can't compare the prices as easily. And um, so you might be saying, well, how does that pricing consultant live with themselves? How do they go home and feel good about their life because they've just caused someone to spend more money at the, at the restaurant. Well, actually, they go home feeling great because the reason people spend more money is because they're more likely to choose things that they want to eat. And um, uh, so here you have two different value systems operating at the same time with two people who think they're doing something ergonomic um, Uh, let's go to some more blatant ones here. So, uh, apologize, I actually ate that one. I didn't mean to eat all the <laughs> my props here, but uh, yeah, we, yeah. So, uh, the nutrition facts are bold, in your face. They didn't used to be. Um, the first time they passed the law saying these nutrition facts have to be on there. All the vendors made them in the smallest font they possibly could. <laughs> and then they passed a law that said it has to be in a nice big, at least this big, and it has to be this font. So now we have these nutrition facts to help us decide whether we should eat that thing. But look at this example of anti-ergonomy. The flap <laughs> covers. And I tried to figure it out. I think it's brand specific, but I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm not really here to diss any particular manufacturers. Um, let's just take a couple of these others. That, that's clearly a, um, a good guy, I suppose. Um, the other interesting thing about this is the flap doesn't need to be this big. The flap is really small on this one. So uh, I'll pass those around and... Um, uh, I only need the wrappers back, but... <laughs> uh. And again, the trick there is to move our attention away from the long-term impacts and control the, the time and um, space that we do our analysis of whether something's good for us or not. So here's a summary of what I've talked about. Changes of scale. Uh, contradictory viewpoints and value systems, competing economic interests, the safety paradox, and erroneous or subjective risk assessment. So let's look at um, how does this apply to computing devices? Well, web advertising is an interesting one because it's very hard to, for me to view it any other way than inherently and not very ergonomic. Because even if you're really good 
And actually, it looked from the statistics I could find, people are actually getting worse at making ads that people actually click on. It means that all these web pages have information on them that are not associated with the task of the user at hand. In fact, they're not uh, associated with for the vast majority of, of users. So, here's another one I've, I'm going to repurpose Bill Buxton's nice example of um, uh, analyzing interfaces uh, according to the task. So in his example, he points out that the Etch-a-Sketch uh, turns out to be great if you need to draw rectangles of various uh, kinds, but hopeless if you want to write your signature. And uh, uh, the Skadoodle, it's the opposite. It's great for signatures, but really hard to, in fact, they, they sell these templates to assist you to draw a well-defined shape. My point about those things is that a lot of ludic instruments of interaction, toys, um, are anti-ergonomic, and uh, deliberately so, because we want them that way, because we want the challenge. Uh, we value puzzles and challenges. And in fact, I think in some ways, this is probably a stronger, more interesting tool for me to understand why musical instruments in a lot of cultures are so hard to play. Um, and there's some actually deep reasons that are worth studying. I recommend you take a look at this book called Play, How It Shapes the Brain, Opens the Imagination, and Invigorates the Soul by Stuart Brown. Uh, he basically um, uses uh, neoteny, which is the retention of adult features, um, uh, uh, in adults, or features of juveniles, which is a feature of human beings. Basically, in most animals, stop playing and get kind of boring and grumpy and uh, goal-oriented <laughs> as adults. Um, we are, of all the apes, extremely in the other direction. We carry through childlike, playful enthusiasms uh, for, a very long, um, for a very long time. And one of the explanations of that, and one of the things when you look at play, is it's about the construction and exploration of challenges, things that aren't ergonomic, um, that we have to overcome in, or in order to build skills up. So this is a rather amazing fellow, um, Biltchid, um, and you can go look at some spectacular uh, uh, You see, we, we reward people who uh, create extreme occasions for us, as, as a musicologist, Saeed, described um, this interest in, in um, concert going and musicianship, high levels of musicianship, is our enthusiasm, same enthusiasm we have for sports. Something special has to happen at the occasion. And um, uh, when we see someone able to do something which seems extremely challenging for us, we reward them. Um. So now, now we have a model which is kind of at a personal level uh, might suggest why we should be looking at both sides of ergonomy. I want to try and explain one of the things that has been under my skin for a long time, which I think I finally nailed, which is why did uh, 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 a good family friend, Larry Tesla, <laughs> uh, come to the conclusion that we needed a one-button mouse? And the reason it annoyed me is because before I even saw a Macintosh, I'd already used a four-button puck uh, uh, scroll wheels, uh, light pens, a huge array of uh, joysticks, all those devices. And the idea that you could actually suggest that taking some of those buttons away would be more ergonomic, and that not only that, that you've actually done the research, and, and it, 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 it just has, seem, has seemed very odd to me. And it, this isn't the only one. I've, uh, a recent example, Bill Buxton worked really hard, did some beautiful work, showing how we can seamlessly use two devices at once. Um, and he managed to convince a Wacom to make their multiple pens work concurrently, a puck and a pen, and built a nice set of products at Alias Wavefront that show how much more productive you are as a designer when you can do, uh, when you have both hands active at once. And then a couple of years ago, Wacom took two device support out of their product. Why would you do that? 
I uh, know, constant. I, the, I, I will list some others. Let's, let's analyze this a moment. But I need a tool, and the tool I'm cho choosing right now uh, is Weber's tripartite authority classification. It's a bit of a stretch, but, but bear with me. Um, so there are three ways authority, and I'm going to suggest that a company like Apple um, has to convince you to buy their products. You, do, you wouldn't just spontaneously volunteer to buy them. So there's an issue of authority here. Um, and I would suggest that a company like Apple is mostly based on using charismatic authority. Uh, people get a little bit upset when I say the reason they have an iPhone is because Steve Jobs said it's cool. Um, but it does essentially come from that point. And um, uh, there's an interesting process. So the other two kinds of authority, traditional authority, it's because things were always done that way. Um, you know, I'm driving this far apart because that guy is that guy. That's, it's always been like that. Ever since I've been driving, we've been three car lengths away. Um, and the other one is institutions and bureaucracy, rational. And this is where evidence-based research, this is where traditional human factors, let's run some trials, let's get some uh, knowledge about what's actually going on. That's where this lives. And that's where when you discover that uh, wearing seatbelts is a good idea, the rational legal system kicks in and starts <laughs> building a, an incredibly expensive fight against the charismatic imagery. So we had in the 40s and 50s endless charismatic imagery of famous, revered um, um, actors, film stars, um, smoking and drinking. And they, ha they have to be unraveled um, through the re rational legal process. Um, until they get built in as tradition. So there's a kind of flow of authority between these. And one of the more interesting ones is called r routinization, which is the flow from a charismatic uh, authority into a traditional, uh, traditional one. And uh, I would suggest, this is a good model to explain why on earth, and I'm picking Apple because I'm familiar with their products, not because I endorse them or don't endorse them. But if you look at the history of, of the ports on Macintoshes, you find this fascinating uh, rotation, or I call it, it's really a churn, between an innovation like, uh, I think Apple was one of the earliest to have a single bus to put all the keyboards and mice on. Uh, it was called ADB. But um, that got co-opted and re repurposed and reorganized as USB by Intel, which of course is an Intel Microsoft. It's a traditional model of authority about what computers should be and who should use them. Why is it the traditional model? Because in business, you use the computer the boss, your boss bought for you, and your boss bought that one because his boss said you should show it, so on. There's a hierarchical um, structure. Uh, and that's what companies like Microsoft and Intel uh, focus their energies on. Um, so uh, the same thing. Apple worked on the standardization of SCSI. And then in their own products, once it had become a sta standard, they used their own connector, not the standard connector. Um, and then they developed another standard called Firewire, which was an interesting, innovative, uh, charismatic. It was simplifying. It has some charismatic qualities. Um, that's Firewire. And now they're fading Firewire out. Why? Partly because USB won. Um, uh, even though you can actually show, if you go back to evidence-based things, you can actually show that Firewire is faster when talking to disk drives than, than USB. Um, and so they, these are markers for me, this kind of churn of this routinization process where um, Apple uh, its brand and its identity and its function in the world is defined by this kind of charismatic process of, of, of uh, um, blessing these objects um, and inviting us to invent uh, a use for them. Interesting feature of charismatic objects, that uh, actually, uh, is that if you look at the announcement of the iPad and look at Steve Jobs, he never tells you that this is more ergonomic, this is going to be... Uh, what, he's, what, he, what he says is it's cool, basically. He's, he invites you to answer the question in large numbers collaboratively, what on earth is this thing good for? He's really asking the question of what, uh, or asking you uh, to help him by <laughs> giving him some money, 
what, what is this used for? And, and the, the whole thing about the App Store and, in, and the evangelism, that's the word they use, of developers is because they don't know yet what the killer app is. For the iPod, it's probably iTunes, um, and it's probably shopping when it comes down to it. Um, that's what these devices seem to be really good at. But Steve Jobs um, regularly um, puts games on the forefront um, of new platforms that he introduces and um, uh, taps into, my claim is it's tapping into that early, that, that interest we have in growing ourselves and learning new things. Um, and, but after a while, as soon as, as, soon as he's successful uh, and the other companies say, oh, that's successful, we better have a mouse in our product, and they put three buttons on there, he's got a problem. And the problem is um, the brand and the idea of charismatic authority is locked up in the one buttonness of the mouse. So that results in something like this. Um, well, these are the one button mice. Hello. There we go. These are the one button mice. Here's a one button mouse that's actually a two and a half button mice. It's actually hard to understand. Uh, <laughs> and fully explain where the buttons are. It's actually a capacitive touch sensor on either side and a single switch, but it's able to emulate whilst appearing to be a one button thing, uh, uh, the function. So that I, my claim is that the design of this is based on trying to balance the authority of the three button um, mice established by Logitech and IBM and so on uh, against the need for the charismatic and this idea of simplifying things is a feature of charismatic objects. I'll give you an example. Well, the extreme example is um, holy water. Um, its value is entire. You're invited to uh, create its value um, from this by observing this blessing process. But it essentially, in a certain sense, from for one of these tradi models, it's water. So uh, I, I actually collect these. Um, uh, charismatic devices, and I want to share a few of them with you, if I can find them. Uh, yeah, there must be one of these. Oh yeah, here we go. So here's one I collected, uh, and I'll pass this round, because you have to hear and see. It's a neon wired to some, to a piezo electric strip, and as you move you create the electricity that powers the neon. You hear the little lightning bolt inside. Uh, it's interactive. It's got a remarkably small number of things. And it has a magic that invites you, as it did me, to go buy some more piezo-resistive material from those people and see what I can make with it. Um, here's a couple I've made that some of, I see some of my students here are familiar with. This is a, a color synthesizer made with four different components. Uh, there's green, some red, and if you press harder against elastic bands, you get the mixtures. So I'll pass that round um, also. But my favorite right now, because I teach all this um, uh, fabric interaction, is this one, because it only has two elements. Uh, a piece of piezo-resistive uh, fabric and a battery, and let's, let me pass these around in a group. What you do is you press the fabric against the terminals until it's time to pass it on. And the interesting thing about, for me about these is that I have an input-output device, I have a computation happening, I have interactivity uh, on a human scale, and so, and I don't know how to make it any less than two, two elements. And I'm trying not to layer judgments over these three kinds of authority. I'm trying right now to understand where they fit into the world because my most successful uh, musical instrument design paradigm currently is not to build instruments myself at all, but to teach the performer how to make them. And the way I do that is by uh, sharing the magic of these very simple devices. And uh, 
uh, seeing what wonderful things they do with them um, and feeding back a cycle there. And the issues of how these may become traditional instruments at some point, definitely uh, I'm interested in that. But initially, to get people to overcome that initial um, inertia uh, to just be happy with the way they are, charismatic devices are very valuable for that. And my claim is that's exactly what Larry Tesla was discovering. You see, I wasn't the typical user in 1980. I would already, I was lucky I was at school. We had all these devices. But the typical uh, user of the mouse had never seen a mouse, had never seen a graphical user interface. And most of them, uh, this was their first computer. So there's a completely different problem you have to solve. Um, uh, and it's not at that point about performance, the uh, sort of narrow ergonomic system performance point of view. It's about getting the person to even learn to use the mouse in the first place and feel comfortable with it. And charismatic properties like a small number of choices and a call on your imagination to imagine what you might do by moving this mouse are the, are the keys to success. Um, so... Let's see some other charismatic objects. Um, where is the, yeah, here we go. Yeah. So a student of mine who's at MIT Media Lab right now, uh, Hannah Penner Wilson, came up with this idea. It's six conductive patches and a conductive ball that spins around. And the idea is you put this on your, as a bracelet, forget this part for the moment. And you'll notice the ball as I tilt, sorry, probably giving you seasickness there, I mean, uh, rotates around. So this is a tilt sensor, and it's inherently in the fabric. And um, her application of it was to connect it to a bracelet on a boyfriend's arm that had LEDs that lit up in the corresponding positions. And I thought, wow, it'd be fun to do a wireless version. Then you have a kind of high-tech chastity belt, where you can track what's going on with someone else's bodies. Um, actually, this is my implementation of that, because I thought it'd be nice to figure out if we could get a continuous uh, position. And because I'm using a, a resistive material, like the material you've been burning your hands, fingers with there, if you've been squeezing hard enough, um, uh, it's piezo-resistive. Its electrical resistance goes down when you squeeze it, so I can also sense how hard you're pressing. So this can be, a, in the same device, it can be an uh, indicator, um, a, a, an actuator, and it can sense orientation. Now, s the keen observer will note that the thing fails to work when you turn your hand the other way up. Well, that's easy because you just make another one on the other side. In fact, if you've got the patience, you should make an entire s suit covered with these things. Um, now, that may seem ridiculous, but actually, that's the future of e-textile work, is instead of layering various fabrics and materials on the top, you actually weave it in. And this is a, one of my students, Christy Matson, made this after my class. Uh, it's a rather beautiful weave. Um, it's got a very special property. It's a double weave. It's a Navajo style double weave. You may have seen serpent, interlocked serpent motifs in the traditional version. But what's going on here is that these white threads are conductive, but, uh, and they alternate sides on the surface. So this one is now here, pops out there, it's now there, and it's now here. And the trick is that none of those uh, conductors, horizontal or vertical, electrically connect to each other. So I can build um, proximity over this sensing, over this fabric, and you'll see a little fuzzy piece right in there. I actually drove a felting machine. I drove some uh, resistive thread in there, and now I can do pressure sensing at that point. Um, we're starting to get the threads and materials we need to uh, build electronics. Uh, we can build diodes, we can build transistors, there are people building organic memories uh, into fabrics. So it's a really interesting new medium for uh, interaction. Here's a music keyboard uh, that was embroidered with a USB controlled embroidery machine. Those are the conductive threads. And you just lay this on top of a uh, 
one of those piezo-resistive <coughs> Um, sheets of piezo-resistive fabric and you can sense position and pressure concurrently, independently and if you want, put it on your clothing. We're going for time. Ah, almost out. Um, let me just move on. I'm yeah. I want to give you a little glimpse of what uh, a completely authority balanced view of music making might be. This is ergonomic by all the measures I've come up with. It's traditional and um, you can't see by looking at the picture so I'm going to pause it. Well, I'm going to let it go. Um, none of these musicians have played together before I shot this. Um, they're playing rhythmically really difficult music without making any mistakes. They can do this, you can hire them to do this for six hours in a row. They're standing up. They're very relaxed, although they're injecting enormous amounts of energy. This is very loud. Those are nylon stringed instruments, but they can be as loud as steel string instruments. You'll notice the bodies of the guitars, are, which are called haranas, are smaller. Um, the reason they can play so well together is everybody knows everybody else's part. Uh, together they probably know 300 verses to the song La Bamba, which is one of the songs in their tradition. Um, because instead of waiting uh, a long time uh, and struggling to play a half size instrument, they make the instruments that they play themselves and they make them um, by learning from a charisma charisma the best char charismatic authority for them, which is their parents and their family, they learn how to make them, they make them themselves, and they start with a thing called a harana mosquito, which is about this big, when they're only this tall, they can barely dance, uh, and they learn that part, and then they have the instrument scaled all the way up, and they're all viable instrument. It's not, there's the guitar, this big heavy thing that's hard to carry around, and then these half-size ones that sound terrible, it's a continuous, organic, each one ergo ergonomically fitting the person who's learning it. Um, and everybody learns the harana, which is the core rhythmic part. And um, um, everybody learns the harp, although they often don't play it. Um, there's typically only one harpist in the configuration. And uh, uh, there's no conductor and there's no written written music. And I would suggest that some of those vehicles, the written music and the conductor, uh, uh, these, some of these traditional vehicles that are uh, anti-ergonomic, um, may not be a, a, a good model. Um, this may be a more balanced model. And the question is how to replicate this model um, in general interaction problems for, for electronic musical instruments. but. Um, uh, one of the things that it suggests immediately is that you should have kids involved in building uh, iPads um, and uh, multi-touch devices. And I think if you did that, you'd discover they'd want to do things like play music, and you'd discover that they were too slow. Well, we were actually already know that, but um, I, I invite the industry to, uh, uh, to look at a balanced view of authority and ergo ergonomy. So, uh, I'll leave it there, but I have time for questions, I believe. <laughs> oh, let me just pass these around. Um. Yes, any questions? Yes, Terry. So, just a question from this. If you look around the world, the sort of authoritarian conductor script kind of model a Western imposition on a lot of the world, or has it also come out in other Yes. Um, that, uh, it's not an area of expertise I have, but yeah, it does emerge. It does emerge out of in different cultures. And there's lots of music making in Mexico that follows the traditional model. This is a particular region, Veracruz, and in fact, the guitar is infiltrating and dismantling the tradition. Um, um, you see, yeah, there's, yeah, it's a complex process. So. Other. 
Yes. A little bit about the collaborative nature you mentioned earlier in your talk about how you, you, you say it's a bit of a lie that you're here by yourself and that yes. so much of your work is collaborative. Um, and that, of course, in some of the, in the psychology group think there's always the idea of personal skills and working in a group. And since it's obviously a success with the challenges, I'm sure, can you speak a little bit about directly your experiences uh, oh. under the theme of collaboration? Um, you know, I think I want to do that a little bit obliquely. Uh, I think I want to just improvise right now an analysis of this room from the point of view of a collaborative space, because we've just dropped into a collaborative mode here. So this is a beautiful room, carefully designed, carefully engineered, but it, from the ergonomics from your point of view is great. Your chairs are comfortable, you can all see me. Um, from my point of view, it's terrible and that this is a common pattern for performers and it's terrible there's lots of reasons let me just summarize some um, you can hear me very easily but I can't hear you now why should I if I'm lecturing why do I need to hear you well I, one of the reasons I need that feedback is I need to know whether you're taking notes on your laptop uh, uh, playing a game and I, 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 I need to have a sense of who is actually <laughs> Uh, part of this collaborative process and you'll notice that because I can't tell that that people this didn't <coughs> used to be the case see if I didn't have this microphone this is my instrument of interaction with you if I got rid of this microphone the device I would use and ex all public speakers know this device to get you to come down and be more part of the collaboration is I would start speaking quietly and you would have to come down closer to work to be able to, to hear me, and so we would have more eye contact. So these, it, so these are not neutral devices. You think you're doing the right thing, making sure everyone <coughs> can hear me. And um, other examples of well, so what? So what? Would, so how should we redesign the room to increase that? Well, restaurants do this already. They make the the walls reflective. They create a buzz. They create noise. Uh, in some ways, that's anti-ergonomic. It makes a one-to-one -one conversation difficult, but it creates a collaborative ambiance. Um, if we had mirrors all the way around here, I could see what you were doing on your laptop. Okay? But actually, way more interestingly would be, I want to see every one of your laptops up here. Because when I make some crazy claim that I've just invented about some place you should go learn something about, you should be going... On, if you have your laptop and learning about it and contradicting me and starting a discussion based on that and then you can say look what I just found and we can actually create an interactive um, situation um, yeah that doesn't directly answer your question but it just shows that if you if you what I'm doing there is I'm looking at ergonomy from as many people in the situation as possible and what the role of the interaction devices are and um, um, one of the things you should study is the panopticon, which is a prison. Some of you probably have, but what this current situation means is that I'm the prisoner, you're the observers, and I can't see what, what you're thinking, I can't see what... Uh, whereas what I just suggested, of putting your laptops up here, turns it around, it makes us all equal, equal players in observing Sorry, that was a strange answer to a good question, but I hope it helps. <laughs> yes? Sort of going back to your principle of, of authority, uh, how, how does the notion of, say, say, fashion fit into it? I mean, sort of one of the models, <coughs> is a kind of epidemiological model. Waves come and, waves come and go, it's kind of effective. There may be drivers for purposes. Uh, another cut of it is, in the fabric, fabric work, where does, uh, is that jewelry or is that those clothes? Actually, this one probably is more specifically jewelry. Uh, this is a, a ring, uh, and you can build interactive games. It's got an accelerometer on it, and I build a few games running lights around it. Um, how, how do you see fashion fitting in, into the, the authority? Well... I'm just, starting, I'm just starting a larger study with collaborators in 
in Concordia and McGill and, and so on. I invite anyone else who wants to join. But I'm actually cataloging these instruments of interaction. And I've picked a little clumsy odd phrase to distinguish from uh, the traditional model of interaction. Because I'm finding it helpful to look at a very wide range. So fashion, obviously, clothes, they are uh, about inviting certain categories of interaction between people. And so they're interesting to study. For me, the price sticker that's on a product is an instrument of interaction. And it's a very interesting one, similarly to the musical instruments, because um, most transactions in, in human history, in time and space, have been done without fixed prices. That's a relatively recent invention. And there's an instrument that reduces the amount of haggling you have to do. But if you study it carefully, it biases the um, interests of the person fixing the price. And it, it cre and they encourages them to create games that we play happily to do with coupon clipping. And um, uh, so I'm collecting all those things. Fashion is obviously a really important one. And um, the interactive fashion one, uh, the thing that's interesting about e-textiles is that it's a different kind of portable device than a device. Uh, you know, there are obviously some issues with carrying a big pad around which aren't the same as if you have it in your clothing already. And uh, people are building Twitter displays into their clothing. And that suggests an inter interesting social dynamic about why would you want to announce your tweets uh, physically. So, yeah. A good transition. Next time you speak, we'll all have our, our Twitter devices. Exactly. So you can see us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Yes, I'd be happy to. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.